alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter by chapter, verse by verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family. Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. Book of St. John, chapter 8, verse 22 here in a moment with a word of wisdom from our Father. Jesus is talking to a group of people that just simply can't hear. And he's going to explain to us who they are and why they have always been with us and why they probably will be right to the end. They are what would be alluded to in one of the books, Matthew is the tares. And he will explain that. He said, hey, I'm, I'm going somewhere, and where I go, you cannot come. Because they had to accept him, or you're not going to have eternal life. But even a Kenite, if they truly, from their heart, accept Christ, then they're no longer a child of the devil, but a, a child of the Father, because they're converted. That's, that's what God sent the Savior for, the office, and so it is. So then let's pick it up, if we may, chapter 8, verse 22, and it reads, Then said the Jews, this is Eudas, uh, this, anybody living in the land of Judea is called by this name, will he kill himself? Because he saith, whither I go, you cannot come. And um, naturally, um, he knows that he's going to be crucified. Verse 23. And he said unto them, ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. This is something that's difficult for some of God's elect to get through their mind. We're not of this world. This isn't that. We're of the eternal world. And the eternity it shall be. And sometimes you get um, a little stuck on this earth age because we have work to do here, and that's fine. That's natural. We need to get that work done. But still, you look forward to what our true home is. It's beautiful. Verse 24. I said therefore unto you, Christ continues, that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, you, you, if you convert, then you become a child of God. If not, you're, you're um, held down. And, and so it is. Verse 25. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. 26. I have many things to say and to judge of you. He's not going to judge them, but he will judge what they do. But he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. In other words, he speaks salvation to the world. All you have to do is believe upon him. He did the hard thing. He paid the price on the cross. And to believe is an awesome thing. It sets you free from many of the hang-ups of this world. Verse 27, they understood not that he spake to them of the Father. You see, there's more than one Father. You'll notice that one was in uppercase. That's our Heavenly Father. But they have a Father of the world also. Sometimes he's called the Prince of this world. Verse 28, Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, on the cross, of course, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. He was the living Word. The Word became flesh and walked among us. When you partake of his body, his body is the Word. It is the Word of God. It is what gives you understanding. It's what gives you strength. 29. And he that sent me is with me. 
Well, they were one and the same. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. I will never leave thee, I will never forsake thee. That's the promise of the living God. And that's to you. To you that sometimes you feel you're all alone, and it's a bad old world out there. He's not going to leave you. You can leave him, but he's not going to leave you. As long as you love him, and as long as you follow his word, um, he's going to be with you. That's his promise. Now in verse 30, we go with the next verse, please. As he spake these words, many believed on him. They were converted. They heard. They had ears to hear. 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, that's God's word, then are you my disciples indeed. I don't care who you are, whether you're Kenite, whether you're of the true tribe of Judah, the true, true tribe of Israel, or any one of the Gentile nations. When you believe upon him, you are one of his disciples indeed. Verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The, the truth will always do that. That's why it's so precious to study the living word of God and to learn that truth that sets you free from the anxieties of this world age when you realize it's all written right here in this letter God sent to us. And in learning those truths, you are free from the anxieties that most people are hooked up with. Why? Because they haven't read. They don't know. The truth. What is it that sets you free? The truth of God's Word. In loving Him, it sets you free. Verse, um, verse 33, to continue. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed. And were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? Question. Now, you see, we have a little lack of scholarship here. If, if they were indeed Abraham's seed, they would have been in captivity for 400 years. So there's something, something where all of Israel went into captivity. Where did they come from? They weren't in bondage to anybody. And so, and so it is. It gives you a little something to think about here. In other words, what they're saying is branding them. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, or truly for a fact, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. You become a slave to it. Verse 35, And the slave, servant or the slave abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. That you can count on. 36, If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And when, when you accept him and when you love him, he being the living word, when you take that word, it will set you free. Verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. Um, now, uh, how, how could that be? How could Christ say, I know you're Abraham's seed? He knows that if they were truly Abraham's seed, they would have been in captivity 400 years. It's, what was Abraham's name before God changed it by divine intervention? It was Abram, which simply means a high father. But God changed his name to a father of many people. By what? By adoption. By adoption from what? By adoption in the Lord Jesus Christ, or you don't make it. So uh, that way Christ could say, yeah, I, I know you are. If you believed, you would be. Verse 38, I speak that which I have seen with my Father. Notice that's uppercase. 
and you do that which you have seen with your father, lowercase. Got two fathers here. Have you ever been taught that? There's the true father and there's the fake. Now, the one that you follow determines where you're going to be. The one that you pay allegiance to, the one that you study under, is the one you're going to follow. Now, this false father comes at the sixth trump. The true father returns at the seventh trump in, in the role of Savior. Verse 39. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. Now listen carefully. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Verse 40. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Abraham didn't do that. 41. You do the deeds of your father. Again, lowercase. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. How can it still be a lower case then? And Christ not recognizing it as uh, authority. No, because it's Satan. 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. 43, why do you not understand my speech? Question. Even because you cannot hear my word, you don't have ears to hear. Verse 44, ye are of your father the devil. Makes it pretty plain. And the lust of your father he will do. <clears throat> he was a murderer from the beginning. Now, that gives you a clue. Who was the first murderer? Well, it was Cain, of course. And what, what are Cain's offspring called? Kenites and, um, in the Hebrew tongue. And naturally, um, there you have it. And abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And so Satan is. Now, <clears throat> many people, that's why I've never heard such a thing as Satan having children here on earth. Well, have you never read the scripture? What, what did you do with Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 16? When Eve slipped, and God said to the serpent, Listen to my words. God said to the serpent. That's one of Satan's names. If you need clarification, go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. The serpent is only one of the names of Satan in a role he plays. It wasn't a snake. But it states very clearly in that 15th verse of chapter 3 and 16, uh, chapter 3, Genesis 15 and 16, the father says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. Now, this seed is from his children. You shall bruise his heel. They did. They nailed him to the cross. But he's going to bust your head. That's at the very ultimate end. He will bring that to pass. Well, is that... Uh, is that, well, who, let me ask you another question. The Kenites, the offspring of Cain, when Eve fell, and that first child was born, um, what, um, what, did, what occupation did they take up soon after this? What, what, have you ever read First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55? You got, before that 55th verse, you've got all the tribe of Judah laid out there, and then it said, and these are the scribes that Judah had hired to do scribe work. Okay? And it's the Kenites. 
They were already keeping books for Judah way back when First Chronicles was written. I don't know, who do you let do your books? You might stop and think about that. By the, by the Kenite keeping the books, a scholar must be very careful even in the Word of God where those books were kept and records were kept. They like to change things as best they can. However, thank God for the Masara, the scriptures are locked even to then. Or, what can you say when you might wonder, well, where else would it say this, that they're the children of the devil? Well, have you ever read the book of Revelation? There's only two churches that Christ was pleased with, Smyrna and Philadelphia. And why was Christ pleased with the church of Smyrna and Philadelphia? Because of what they taught what they stood for, because only those two churches stood for the truth. Well, what truth was that? Chapter 2, the great book of Revelation, verse 9, this is the church of Smyrna. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, claim to be our brother Judah, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. It was his offspring, the lowercase father. Or go to the, what did the other church have in common with the church of Smyrna that caused God to love them? And this would be to the church of, the, of, of Philadelphia, where he says, I, I, I know I've opened a door, I've given you the key to David, which means the true Christ and from the fake. And... Um, and then to lock in why God loved the church of Philadelphia, the church of brotherly love. Verse 8, I know thy works, and behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. And thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast, not, and, um, hast, kept my word, and hast not denied my name. You didn't let some substitute slip in. Verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, that is to say of our brother Judah, but are Kenites, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Why would they come and worship at your feet? Because you're at the feet of Christ. They're worshiping him. Why? On the first day of the millennium, every knee will bow to Christ. They won't stay there. But when, when they see they have no choice, on the first day of the millennium, when the power of the living God brings forth the Son, all are going to bow to him. But a thousand years later, many of them will slip away. So there you have it. That uh, uh, it, it is the teachings of Almighty God that you have these people that they don't love the Lord. They're going to do many things that prevent the real truth from coming forth. And many might say, well, I've never heard that before. Well, there's a reason you haven't. Well, my church doesn't teach that. Well, then your church doesn't teach the Bible, do they? That, that's a shame. Because if your church doesn't teach the Word of God, what does it teach? Now, where could Christ make this any plainer that the devil had children here on earth and we should be aware of that? And naturally, it's the 13th chapter of Matthew. And he, he lets you know very clearly in verse 35. Let's read it. Matthew 13, verse 35 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. That word foundation is katabo, which in, means the overthrow of Satan in the first earth age. Been kept secret ever since then. 36, then Jesus said, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, 
declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. They didn't quite understand it. Because Jesus told them, hey, hey, you plant this wheat, so good seed, and an enemy will come and plant this wicked seed. And, and when they grow up, you leave them alone. Why? Well, the parable speaks of zawan and wheat. Zawan, when it's growing, looks just like wheat. But when it comes to harvest, wheat is this rich golden grain that we make bread from, and zawan is a black poisonous uh, grain. And that's the way it is with the Kenites. Now, let's see how he can make this a little plainer. We, in other words, he's not going to be talking in a parable here. He sent the people away. He's going to be talking straight on to the twelve. Listen carefully. 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That is the Spirit that moved upon the waters, the Father that sent the Savior. He's the one that set the good seed, the children, here on earth. 38, the field is the world. This world right here, you walk on it. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Well, now let me think. Wicked one. Who is the wicked one? Give me a break. Okay. Who is the wickedest of all? Satan is, of course. The devil. The serpent. Lucifer. Whatever name you wish to call him by. 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. That should take any doubt whatsoever out of your mind. This word, um, the, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels, and therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of the world. That is to say the end of the millennium. Well, how, how can that be? He said, you leave them alone, but be aware of them. Know who they are. And... When false teachings come forth, be careful. Don't, don't be gullible. And well, uh, again, there are some might say, I've never heard such talk. Well, that's Christ's teaching. Those aren't the words of men. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word seed there, do you know what that word seed is in the Greek? It's sperma, male sperm. So you don't have, if you don't have any doubt from that, then I don't know how to help you. But Christ is making it very clear as to what happened and what you should be careful of today. So returning then again, if I may, to the next verse in chapter 8, which would be 45. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. And sure enough, they, many wouldn't. Verse 46, which of you convinceth me of sin? Who, who can identify some sin I've done? I've performed miracles. I've healed people. I, I've um, made a lame person walk. And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? Do you, do you want to know what the answer to that is? Would you believe it if Christ answered it for you? because he's about to. Listen to it. 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. And he identifies the Kenite, and he makes it very clear. Now, um, well, why was it that certain churches... Uh, many years ago, wanted to take this uh, eighth chapter of John out of the Bible. Well, I think it becomes pretty obvious, does it not, why somebody might want to remove it? But it's truth, and it stays. And truth doesn't go away. Truth makes you free. Free from deception. There's no way that a Kenite can deceive you when you have this Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ in your very being. Our brother, our true brother Judas suffers a great deal of consternation 
because of the Kenite that claims to be of our brother Judah and does not, and he is a liar. Verse 48, then answered the Jews, he ruled us, which these are Kenites, and he said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? In other words, Samaritans were always looked down upon as a second-class people, and uh, we discussed that earlier. And they've accusing Christ of being a devil. Verse 49, Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. 50, and I seek not mine own glory. I'm not trying to make a name for myself. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. That is Almighty God himself. He's the chief judge. 51, verily, verily, truly for a fact I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And um, here you have it. Why, why would he not see death? Well, the reason Christ came to this earth and was crucified, as is written in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, was to destroy death, which is the devil. And, and certainly, when you have eternal life, there's no way you can see death. Your flesh might see death if it, if it passes before the Lord returns. But your soul is eternal when you love the true Father. Let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 52. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead. And the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. I mean, uh, Abraham kept the word, and the prophets did, and they're dead. Art thou greater, 53, art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead. Whom makest thou, whom makest thou thyself? Listen carefully, 54. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. You claim to be a follower of his, my Father. Verse 55, yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I should be a liar, like unto you. He's calling them a liar straight to their face. But I know him and keep his saying. 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Whoa. When, when could that be? When did Jesus see Abraham? Well, do you, do you realize it's written right here in the New Testament? And uh, I think we'll just take a moment and we'll go there. To Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1. Listen carefully. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, priest of who? Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. So this Melchizedek saw Abraham. He met him there. Uh, Abraham even tithed to him. Verse 2, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being by interpretation this Melchizedek, king of righteousness. And after that also, king of Salem, which is to say, which is king of peace. Now, naturally, the book of John presents Christ as king. So what does that mean? What, who is king of kings and lord of lords? Do you, you surely don't have another. You surely know there's only one. Melchizedek. 
means king. Zedek means the just or uh, the elect or peace, which are, or righteousness, however you want to translate it. We have only one king of kings and lord of lords. We have only one king that is righteous. All earthly kings fall short. So let there be no doubt in your mind as to who Melchizedek was. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. In a role long before he was born of Mary. 33, verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent. In other words, he just appeared. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life. He was eternal but made like unto the Son of God. Do you want me to read that again? Made like unto the Son of God. That's made like unto the Lord Jesus Christ, abideth the priest continually. Why? Because it was the Lord Jesus Christ. So when he told them, I've seen Abraham. He's the one that met Abraham and the tithe was paid to him. You know, uh, it, if you believe God's word, and with Christ being that living word, I would say you would have quite a stretch not to believe that and understand it, because it's pretty simple. A child can understand it. I know it irritates some people when I say that, but it's true. If you just let the scriptures flow, a child can understand without any difficulty. Let's return and finish the chapter, verse uh, 57. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Question. 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. I was a long time before Abraham. Fifty-nine to complete. Then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by divine intervention. God stays in control. He takes care of however he wishes to be. It wasn't Christ's time to be delivered yet. What an important chapter, this eighth chapter of St. John. A wealth of knowledge there to be understood in the simplicity in which only Christ could teach. Letting a person know we have enemies in the world. But there's sure nothing we have to be afraid of. They rather must be afraid of us. Because within us is the Holy Spirit, which is to say the Lord Jesus Christ. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. In his, in his name you have power <clears throat> over all our enemies. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. We have a judge. It's Almighty God. He doesn't really need our help. He can judge all by himself. You have the right to spiritually discern whether what you're hearing is truth or fiction. That you must think for yourself. Don't ever let anyone do your thinking for you. 
if you understand God's word and you follow it, you're able to think for yourself using that ability to, of spiritual discernment to know truth when you hear it and fiction and let it be God's word that rests in your mind and seals you for the eternity itself. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give, give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Got a prayer request, you don't need that number. Don't need an address, why God knows what you're thinking right now. All you have to do is when you pray, you don't even have to open your mouth. He hears you. He's a cardio knower. He knows your heart. So let him know that you love him in return. Why? Because that's what he wants from you more than anything. Hosea 6.6, 6, I don't want your burnt offerings. I want your grace, which is to say your love. And that's what he wants from you. Sacrificially give him that love and be blessed. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you need guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. <clears throat> okay, need more information. This would be Larry from Virginia. Specific information on how to recognize the Antichrist in order to educate my family and myself as well as my friends. We have your CDs, Mark of the Beast, already. Keep up the good work for Christ. We're going to do that. You know, when you know the chronological order of events, sixth Trump, seventh Trump, then you, you, you know that the Antichrist comes first. And as far as identifying him, if you have my free Mark of the Beast tape, in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, it tells you and documents who the Antichrist is. It's not some man born a woman. It's the son of perdition. Well, what does perdition mean? It means the son that perishes. There's only, you don't have a multiple choice. There's only one entity that has already been promised to perish. You can read it in Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. King of Tyrus, which is one of Satan's names. Tyrus means rock, in their rock, not ours. He's going to be turned to ashes from within. He, he's, they're going to be, he's going to be terminated. <clears throat> so he stands in the holy place claiming to be God. So the first, place that stand, the first person that stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God naturally is a forgery. Justin from Ohio, is the one world system yet to come or are we already in the one world system? The one world system does not come to its full potential until after it receives a deadly wound. So the one world, well, how does it get the wound healed? Well, the Antichrist heals that the dragon, which is um, just above the office of Antichrist, which means Satan in that form, uh, causes people to, to uh, make an image to that and worship it meaning he's going to show up as the Lord Jesus Christ and bring peace to the world. That must happen before the one world system can totally come into being. There will be many strides at it, and already you see that happening uh, when you hear people talk of uh, one world systems, of international control. But those are little key words that add up. Gala from Kentucky. Where can I find in the Bible where it says that angels are our loved ones? Well, it doesn't really say angels are our loved ones, but all of our loved ones that passed away are angels because to be absent from this body is to be present by, with the Lord in your spiritual body, that being an angel. As, as a pastor and of many years of um, tending a flock and, and being at many bedsides during the transition of death into, into life, I have more than one time seen a person in the transition of dying be able to see someone in a spiritual body that I could not see and carried on a conversation with them. 
because God always, usually if he loves you, he'll send someone to show you through that path. But your scripture is nearly as you're going to come to it and, and directly is in Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, where it says if you're one of the set-aside ones, elect, that your angel has the face of God at any time he so needs that you need him. And um, that would, um, you can take that for what it's worth. Michelle from New Jersey. Will the Antichrist still let you believe that everything is good? How will we be able to tell the difference between Antichrist and Jesus? The chronological order. Antichrist comes at the sixth trump. True Christ doesn't return until the seventh. Antichrist has many things that he must do. And um, uh, will he tell us everything is good? Let's go to the book of Daniel. How does the Antichrist come in? He comes in prosperously and peacefully. That's just the opposite of what most of your world flicks, movies, would declare Armageddon to be. They'll show you terrible explosions and ghastly sights. That'll fool you for sure because he's coming in as lover boy. He's coming in, I mean, and we'll, there will be world peace. It's going to seem like a really good state of affairs. And uh, <clears throat> pay off everybody's bills, give you anything you want if you'll just worship him. Uh, and uh, so that's how he comes in, prosperously and peacefully. But you don't have to worry about being able to recognize him. He is the fake. Listen to me, the minute the true Christ returns, we are out of our flesh bodies into spiritual bodies. So if somebody shows up on this earth claiming to be Messiah, and even supernatural, and performing miracles that would blow your mind, like Revelation 13 declares, and you're still in a flesh body, he's a fake, okay? Because when Christ comes, we're changed into spiritual bodies. Susan from Ohio. What denomination is Shepherd's Chapel? Shepherd's Chapel is not a denomination. Denomination means division. We're Bible students. We study God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And we teach God's Word as it is written. And um, so be it. That's, that's what it amounts to. Ray from Ontario. When, when, when will there only be farm animals in the eternity? No, 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 no. Isaiah chapter 11 gives you the millennium and afterwards. Who, who, is, um, who is laying down with the lamb? The wolf is. And who, who is this that the cow is eating with? It's a bear. So there's not only a domestic animal, God loves his animals. But you see, there's something has taken place. There are no carnivores, why? Because even the animals are changed into spiritual bodies. And they do not have the urge to tear or rip or, or, or molest. Maddie from Nevada, where can I find the scripture that we will see our loved ones when we go to heaven? Ezekiel chapter 40 to the end is about the millennium, when we're all in spiritual bodies. And in Ezekiel 44, verses 20 through 25, it lets you know if, if you are one of God's elect, and you have a mother, brother, uh, unmarried sister, um, and uh, that didn't make it to the right side of paradise, you can go there and dress them down. Get, get a little discipline going there. Tell them to get their act together and to help them as best you can. But you have to pay a little penalty for being away from Christ for seven days of purity because of that. But you can do that. Ezekiel 44, 25. Johnny from West Virginia. Is the first earth age when God created the world in the beginning? You got it right. Um, this is why verse 1 of the very Genesis itself, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, period. 
It didn't say when. If you want to make a gross mistake, try to say it was 6,000 years ago. That's, that's malarkey. This, uh, and it was, it, 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 it was millions of years ago. And then in verse 2, it says, and the earth, not was, the Hebrew word is very specific. It became void and without form. Why? Because God destroyed it. And um, because of Satan's rebellion. Joseph from North Carolina, if a third of the angels followed Satan and refused to be born to woman, doesn't that mean that all of us born to woman stayed with God in heaven? I hope and pray this is correct. Well, it, I'm sorry, but it isn't. Uh, only 7,000 angels left their place of habitation and came to earth and seduced women rather than be born to them. The third that just went with Satan, they were confused. God wants to save them. And that's why they're here, and that's why he sent the Savior. He's hoping that they will love him and not that fake father of the lower case. That they'll stay with the true father and inherit eternal life. But uh, there are, um, this third, I feel, that followed Satan are living right today. I think that's why that discipline, courtesies fell by the wayside about when this generation began, because God just always does things fair. And if Satan seduced them before, deceived them, then that's the generation he would have living when Satan appears as Antichrist. He wants to know, are they going to do it again? Or are they going to make a stand? That's what he wants to know. Or they will be like the 7,000. The 7,000 die and perish in the streets of Jerusalem when the two witnesses appear uh, and, and resurrect. Uh, Pastor Marie, Tina from Pennsylvania, thank you for your comments. Question, where in the Bible can I find where it talks of, of Mary Magdalene and was she really a prostitute? Absolutely not. You know, it, it is strange how some people like to tag that word prostitute onto women. And, and uh, it just, if you do a little research, You'll find a lot of times it was just men by jealousy that give them a name because they were a better business person than they were. Um, Luke chapter 8, verse 2. Mary Magdalena was not a prostitute, but she's had seven evil spirits. And Christ cleansed those evil spirits, and she was a faithful servant after that. She was no prostitute. C.F. from Ohio. Pastor Murray, thank you. I have learned so much studying with you in three years that I have trouble finding people to have conversations with. Some have been Christians for 20 or 30 years. Question, Revelation 21, first heaven and earth were passed away, and I thought it would be second heaven and earth. Uh, thank you. Well, it, it began again in that first verse. It says, and there will be a new earth. That means rejuvenated. And quite frankly, it is the first earth age rejuvenated right back to like new. It's not new in the sense that you think of new in English, but, but think of it as rejuvenated, which means what? It means that God will put, right now we have uh, a 90 degree tilt, not 90 degrees, a 90 mile tilt because uh, the true north and magnetic north are 90 miles apart. There's a little wobble there. This caused the firmament to come down, and this causes jet streams to cause storms. And when the firmament goes back into its place and rejuvenated back to where it was before, we don't have any storms, no hurricanes, no tornadoes. It's just beautiful everywhere. And that's the way it will be at that time. Rejuvenated. <clears throat> MZ from Minnesota. When Satan was changed from king of Tyre to the prince of Tyre, uh, was this to the first casting down? Yes, it was. He went from king 
In other words, he fell right from the right from the um, covenant, the uh, that is to say, from the altar of God, the place where the cherubim sit. He lost the office of cherubim that covers, and after that, he was called prince. Where was Satan when this happened? Did he stay there? When Satan is kicked out of by Michael, is this uh, another casting down? Yes, it is, and it'll be the last one. Basically, uh, there will be a final one at the end of the millennium. But um, uh, he, during Job's time, he walked to and fro on the earth. Job chapter 1, verse 6. But when Christ told him, after having been tempted by him in the wilderness, you get behind me. Well, now, where is Christ? Well, he's on the, he's on the mercy seat. Well, where is Satan? Behind him. And Michael and his angels are holding him there. Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Isaac from New Mexico. Pastor, I heard, I have read Genesis chapters 3, 5, and 4. I cannot find where it states that Cain is not Adam's son. Please tell me where I can find it in the scripture. Thank you. Well, I really think we probably covered it pretty well for you today. There's one other place you might read, um, and that would be if you have trouble with that, and it's in the great book of Corinthians, the second chapter, I'm sorry, second Corinthians, verse chapter 11, Paul teaching, would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly indeed bear with me. In other words, I, I hope you'll take this to really to heart and listen to me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. I don't want anybody messing with you. Verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve. Now what is this word beguiled? Expatio. What does expatio mean? It means wholly seduced. It only has one meaning. Wholly seduced. Eve, through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, how does one lose their virginity? Well, I think, I think he told you right there. It's kind of a shame that people can't understand God's word. Okay? I hope that, I hope that uh, answers your question. Did, um, did not leave a name. The ten tribes that crossed over the Caucasus Mountains, were they different nationalities? No. They were all of the house of Israel. David from North Carolina, what is Mary's mother of Christ's father's name? And where can I find it? Mary's father's name was Heli. And you will find her gener gene generations and genealogy in Luke chapter 3. It's the only place you'll find it. Um, naturally, Matthew chapter 1, that it says it's the generations of Christ, it's the generations of Joseph who was not Christ's father. But you will find Mary's genealogy in Luke 3, and her father was a Hebrew of the tribe of Judah. But her mother was a Levite because she was a cousin to Elizabeth. How do you get to be a cousin? You've got different mothers or sisters. And if you're a Levite, uh, married to a Levite priest, you have to be full blood. So Christ then came out forever after the order of Melchizedek. He was not only of the king line Judah, but he was also of the Levitical priest line, a high priest forever, and the father being almighty God. Okay, Caroline from Missouri. Thank you for reading the word on TV. My husband and I recently found your program. Okay, you got a question here. I have been involved with churches nearly 20, 30 years, and I have never heard about the three earth ages. Uh, reading and understanding Genesis has opened our eyes and ears about God's plan. Well, praise God. Why do churches not teach about the three earth ages? My husband and I are amazed at this lack of teaching. 
Well, I wish I could answer that, but I think probably today's lecture would give you a good reason why. You know, this, this uh, group likes to steer truth away and maybe print a few quarterlies where all of them kind of teach the same thing and take their little lessons as some translator has laid it out and never, ever study God's Word with any translator other than a Christian. It must be a Christian translator. Uh, K. William from Missouri, would you please explain to me when the dinosaurs roamed the earth? Was, was it during the first earth age? Yes, it was. And, and so, uh, so it was. And God loved them, and they are now extinct, and I'm out of time. You know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. It's the letter that he has sent to you personally. Why? Because he loves you. He wants you to absorb it in the simplicity in which, in which Christ teaches. Not difficult to understand when you take away all that man puts there and uh, listens to your father. Make his day, he'll make yours. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God, he will always bless you. Most important though, you listen to me, listen good. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day even with trouble. Know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The book of Peter, here we have two books, first and second Peter, that, that are absolutely fascinating. That great old fisherman telling us, leading us, directing us, guiding us, going into the depth, if you would, in that second book, into the three earth ages, giving the most accurate recorded account of the events that transpire and document that there are three earth ages, that there was one before this one, this one, and one to come. Peter, the great fisherman, which in his gentleness and his kindness brings us uh, two books, the books of Peter, that lead, guide, direct, even in your daily life, that teach and show you how to be happy, how to find that peace of mind, and to know yourself. The books of Peter, I know you're going to enjoy them. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray.
Open your Bible and let's go to class with Dr. Murray for a better understanding of our Father's Word. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Praise God for the privilege of allowing us to serve Him, that we can deal in His Word, teach His Word, and allow our Father to do the speaking through that Word. We just thank Him so much for that. In the precious name of Yeshua, may He send us a word of wisdom. Okay. Discerning dreams. It's very important to you, beloved. In discerning dreams, by that, by that title, I mean being able to discern dreamers and prophets, so-called. Preachers, teachers. A pro the word prophet uh, basically means to teach. And God choosing teachers, many times the teacher of his word, various gifts, and oftentimes to say to that teacher, as an example, Jeremiah was a teacher, Isaiah was a teacher, Daniel was a